All right, Shannon Vlogs, Shakespeare with Henry the Fourth, Part One, Hollow Crown version. Yay! I watched it. I watched it. <laughs> hey everyone, it's Shannon. I'm continuing on my Shakespeare journey, and uh, most recently I had read Henry the Fourth, Part One, and decided to go and watch the Hollow Crown version of Henry the Fourth, Part One. Before I did that, I actually felt like I kind of did some homework and rewatched Richard the section second which was really really helpful because it placed one of the characters in this one a bit better um, which was the Earl of Northumberland is actually Henry Percy and Henry Percy's son Henry Percy is Hotspur so that really helped because it let me sort of understand that uh, Northumberland was around while King Henry was becoming King Henry and they were sort of like overtaking the kingdom from Richard II. So that really helped because it kind of, when I was reading this, I felt like the Earl of Northumberland was being like, not feeling like Henry should have been king. But when I rewatched that, it's very clear he's there when Richard, you know, sort of gives him the right to be there now is kind of in some ways under duress but anyway so it made it a bit clearer now it feels more confusing now that i'm talking about it <laughs> anyway overall um no not overall let's get to some of the specifics some of the really great things about this have really clarified a lot of the characters for me for sure it really helped with understanding where hotspur at least in this interpretation of the play gets miffy with the king which is that he wants the king to pay for Mortimer's ransom and the king says no <laughs> and Mortimer is Hotspur's wife's brother I think and the king says that he is a revolter and so that sort of sets off Hotspur and also the king's uh one of the king's own Worcester Worcester who ends up sort of like creating the plan for him and Hotspur and the Earl of Northumberland, uh, Henry Percy, to revolt against the king. So that made it much more clear as to why they decided for this to happen and who was banding together to make it happen. It did raise one new question, which is this all comes about when Hotspur is talking to the king about um, the prisoners that he has, but it's like, who was he fighting? <laughs> I was like... So you captured these people, but from where? And what were they doing? So it kind of feels like, hey, we're, we're coming in in the middle here. How, how, did, how did that happen? Anyway, <laughs> just glazing over that. Just glazing over that. One of the, and but another new question it raised uh, was the motivations of King Henry. Like, because the, this portrayal, Jeremy Irons' portrayal of him, he kind of feels like he's not all there, you know, like that he's irrational sometimes. Um, you know, why, why does he not decide to pay the ransom? Like, it's his choice. He's the king. He can do whatever he wants. Um, but there's some other moments where he shows these odd signs of, of weakness, uh, like whether it's mental fatigue or physical fatigue, like that, that are just sort of like red alert, like, so, like, you know, what's going on. And maybe in part two, we'll see that what that what this is leading into but I really felt like I was getting these big signals like from the actor and I'm like what what is going on is he of sound mind I think so I wouldn't there's actually nothing of that I don't know maybe he's just tired and doesn't want to rule anymore I'm not sure so it raised more questions there Claire find some other questions. The whole robbery within a robbery within a robbery thing that I was so confused about while reading the play. This is very clear. Falstaff decides, I'm going to rob these people. And then points comes to Prince Henry and says, hey, let's go rob Falstaff. We'll get disguises. It'll be such a hoot. You know, and, <laughs> and but it kind of goes, and they do do that, but it kind of goes wrong because there's... Falstaff and his friends come back and boast about the robbery and oh my gosh and there was two men and ten men and a hundred men and a thousand and all this stuff and they know it's not true but the kidding the joking jovialness of it sort of takes a turn uh to to hurt the pride of Falstaff which is a recurring thing that happens in the play and it really but it really cemented for me understanding a bit more the friendship between 
Prince Henry and Falstaff and how more so that I understood that Prince Henry wants like his being among the people, you know, hanging out with the the lower classes, I guess, you know, the non-royalty folk and just being in taverns and joking around and putting on, you know, like little performances for each other and stuff like that. Like he feels that people appreciate him for who he is. He's wanted for himself, not his title, but his person um, and what he has to bring to the table. So that really, really uh, made a lot more sense that he was just a friend to people as opposed to, you know, um, royalty. So that was really clear. But what was really awesome about that is you see this huge turn in his character when, you know, everything hits the fan and this is real and, you know, there's been a huge betrayal and there's going to be war. He just turns and he's like, he's on. He is a prince. He will, you know, come up to his title. He will do what needs to be done. Um, but the tragedy of Falstaff's character was very hard to bear. I just like the how much people poke fun at him, you know, and he jests and they all jest and all this. But it just it always has this underlying heartbreak in it that that you don't I don't quite understand. And um no, I understand the heartbreak. I don't understand I don't understand his character that well, I guess. I could feel the moments where his pride was really hurt. I guess in one in one sense it sort of shows an unbalanced friendship, you know, with him and Prince Harry, Henry, sorry. They call him Harry sometimes, but the unbalanced friendship because it feels like Falstaff only has him, you know, whereas Prince Henry has the whole kingdom to take care of, so. No, anyway, but I was much more, I, I found the scenes in the tavern, which there are a lot of, a lot more enjoyable and jovial and wonderful. And Julie Walters is the sort of barkeep type person. And she's amazing. Like, she's amazing. It really had a lively, wonderful, amazing energy to it. And that really worked. Um, so there was a lot of clarification for a lot of the things I wasn't getting. And I really, really appreciated that. Um, I did, the one, there are some challenges though. It, Hotspur, the guy who plays it, was really hard to understand. Like, I had to rewind over and over and rewatch it. And, and I didn't really get his character that much. He's very hot-headed understood that but I like and I can understand him being annoyed but he just he he didn't seem as sort of organized as the as uh, as his success is you know he seems to be the person who bands people together and is, turns his own prisoners to work with him against the king but it's like we don't see any of that I, I wouldn't believe that he would convince anyone of everything anything he's very rude to everyone he is disacknowledging of, of the people that helped him or are supposed to help him which is maybe why some of them don't come through in the end i don't know i just i thought it, he was very rash and that makes sense it works with his character name and all that kind of stuff but it, it didn't it didn't sort of make more sense in in the whole so maybe part two will help actually not with his character because he uh he doesn't make it so <laughs> there is that <laughs> um there are a couple other things about this that were challenging there were some voiceovers uh by uh prince henry uh and uh falstaff i felt that that wasn't for me that wasn't as successful it's harder to understand um, you know, it's a challenge to understand the language at all. And then when you're not seeing the performer, you're just hearing them. That's even more of a challenge. And there were two sort of long sort of, um, I think, I don't know if they were soliloquies, but long parts where it was narration and that was not working for me. Um, but there were so much that was like understanding the Prince Henry and Falstaff friendship and how the, the horror of when it goes wrong and, and, and just, oh, your the heartbreak is so real. Um, of course, some other amazing things about it. Jeremy Irons is really good as the king, even though I did find him like somewhat confusing. But I think that's the part one and part two of it. And can we say Tom Hiddleston? Like he's just amazing. I think it's funny because I think this might be the first period thing I've seen him in. Although nothing, I, no, I watched some of he's in that AMC series. That was the first contemporary thing I've seen him in. But I always see him in stuff that's a bit different this is like historical and Shakespeare and like Loki is like so different anyway so he's just an amazing actor and he lights up on state on screen and I really had 
out of all Jeremy Irons is the easiest to understand. That's my Shakespeare litmus test. Do I understand what the person's saying? Um, Jeremy Irons w got the highest score on that, and then Tom Hiddleston. I did understand him. I did understand what was going on with his character. I understood his motivations. I understood his journey. He was the very clear. He was the clearest. He was the clearest out of all the characters. Um, and um, but some of them else, some of the others, <laughs> not as hard. But it was actually it's kind of interesting because I understand the sort of the the journey of this is really sort of him, you know, being sort of you know, do whatever you want to stepping in and being the dutiful son and, you know, helping the kingdom and that journey. And I get that. But it's so, so much of the story of the heart of the story is between him and Falstaff. And, and I feel like they changed some of the ending with Falstaff too. Um, that he, he, there's, he feigns a fight, but this one, he just feigns death. He watches Henry and Hotspur fight and then pretends to be dead and I didn't really understand that so anyway I'm sure a lot of it will become more clear watching the second part but first I'm going to read the second part so it'll be cool I'll get my little character sheets and I'll actually know who most of the people are I think I don't know if most of the people go from one play to the other those that survive so there you go there is my my sort of review of the hollow crown version and my greater hopefully understanding of Henry the fourth part one I feel like most of my questions were answered um, although I could definitely note that there were some changes as, you know, happens in adaptations, but, uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. Yay! More tricks here! <laughs> Thanks for watching!